We were running a few minutes late in the morning, so we want to get started promptly. We have a packed afternoon agenda. And I'd like to introduce our next keynote and featured speaker, my friend JP Nichols. Um, he's an ex-banker like some of us and has 20 years in banking. Um, and off late, the last few years, has been working at the intersection of fintech and banking and innovation. So please welcome JP Nichols. We all want to change the world. So how many folks here work for a bank or a traditional financial institution? Well, a pretty good chunk of you. Uh, how many people work for a fintech company? Another pretty good chunk of you. I swear a couple of your hands went up twice, but that might be OK. Uh, yeah, as Patty said, I, I spent 20 years uh, helping grow a $6 billion bank to a $400 billion bank. That was a great ride. And for the past few years, I've really been at the intersection of um, helping banks work with fintechs and vice versa. And I'm going to spend uh, just a little bit of time with you today um, kind of talking a little bit about that journey and what I'm seeing happen in that space. How many folks have read The Innovator's Dilemma? This is the last time I'm going to make it. No, it's probably not the last time I make you raise your hands. But OK, those of you that said yes, how many of you are bankers? Yeah, one, all right. So and the reason I keep asking, I've been using uh, this couple of slides in my talks for the past four years, and I keep saying it's outdated, I'm going to take it out. But I keep asking that question, and I spend a lot of time with rooms full of bankers. I was in uh, Phoenix uh, last week. I'll be with the Washington bankers next week and Utah the week after that. And I barely get any hands at all, at all. So all those other hands that went up are people not working inside the banking industry, maybe fintech entrepreneurs. Um, so I often joke that if you say the words bank followed by the word innovation, you have to cite Clayton Christensen's 1997 book. I don't think that's really true. I don't think that's in Dodd-Frank, but just in case, I am in full compliance. I actually wrote about this in American Banker a few years ago now. And for those of you that have read the book, you'll know, and the rest of you, I'll tell you, he tells a great story about the steel industry. And prior to the 1970s, there was only one way to make steel. It was with a very expensive integrated steel manufacturing plant. It cost about a billion dollars to build one of these. So there weren't three people in a garage waking up one morning to say, I'm going to disrupt the steel industry, kind of where we are now in the financial industry. But new technology did emerge, known as mini mills. It came from Asia. Mini mills could make steel for one-tenth the cost of an integrated steel manufacturing plant. There was only one catch. They could only make one kind of steel, and that was rebar the cheap stuff inside the concrete here in the floor and in the walls. So the steel industry actually thought that was great news because that was the lowest margin business. That was on the bottom of the food chain for them. And they said, well, this is great because we're going to be able to move up market. And they did. But what happened was this mini mill technology with a 90% cost advantage began to work their way up. Pretty soon they figured out how to make rods and bars and then structural steel and I-beams and so on. And before too long, the last bastion of margin and, and uh, uh, real profits in the industry was flat rolled steel. And they figured that out too. So today, virtually all of the steel in the world is made through a mini mill process. What was once disruptive is now mainstream. And I don't have to tell you the pain that the steel industry went through, bankruptcies and restructuring and layoffs. And I grew up in the Midwest. and. That was a big part of the, the, the uh, local industry and economy then. It's certainly not now. And the reason I start a banking fintech conference with a story about the steel industry is because when I think about fintech, folks, we're still in the rebar stage. So for the bankers in the room, we have those three people in a garage that are starting something that isn't that cute. That's great. You can have that. You're going to take our low margin customers, and we'll focus on the high margin customers. Well, that might work for today, but I think we got a long way to go here. FinTech is hot, $22 billion invested in equity capital in FinTech globally last year, up from $12 billion the year before, which was triple the year before that. The in FinTech is hot, and the industry, for the most part, is not, at least in terms of innovation. We see three groups we call leaders, learners, and laggards. Very few leaders in innovation. Long tail of laggards who are doing nothing or next to it. And I'm most interested in the group in the middle, the learners, who know they need to do something, and they're starting to try some things, and they're working on it. 
So you may have studied Porter's Five Forces of Business School at some point, and I could go through each one of these and tell you how I, I think the industry is being impacted. But I'm going to focus just on this one, threat of substitution, because it's something the bankers never had to deal with. There was no such thing as substitution. Sure, we had big banks and small banks and savings banks and community banks and savings and loans and credit unions. But let's be honest. They were all pretty much just slightly different flavors of the same thing. And now it's possible to live my complete financial life through apps on my phone that I can download from an app store. And they may or may not have anything. There's probably a financial institution in the background somewhere. But it may not have anything to do with my conscious choice of deciding, oh, I'm going to bank with Bank X because I like what they do or whatever. So this has changed the game, I believe, very significantly and yet not nearly as significantly as we'll see as we go forward. This should be in Dodd-Frank too. Just about everybody that talks about fintech and disruption of banking has been using this slide for the last couple of years. It's a good one from CB Insights. Uh, they took the Wells Fargo website in this case. It could probably be any of your banks where every line of business that you're in, every line on your income statement and your balance sheet now has one or more substitutes, non-bank competitors that are going after this business. There's a big number, $4.7 trillion. That's what Goldman Sachs says all of that disruption is going to cost the industry. This disintermediation of all of these new choices for the consumers, they've got a lot of new choice now, and it's not just competing with one another. There's an old joke about campers, and a bear comes to the campsite, and one camper laces up his shoes, and his friend says, what are you doing? You can't outrun a bear. And he says, well, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. And that's kind of how we thought about it in the industry, right? Oh, you don't like the way our bank does things. Well, OK, you can go to another bank, but they're not going to be that different than us. Well, suddenly, that difference is getting a lot bigger. Now, having said all of that, I do believe banking will survive. I can't imagine a time in my lifetime or my daughter's lifetime that we won't have banking for sure, storing of assets and liabilities and movement of money. And I can't even imagine a time we won't have banks. But that's not the question. I think too many bankers take undue solace in this notion. Yep, that's right. We'll always have banks. Banks will survive. But will your bank? That's really the question. So what's it take to keep up with this era of digital disruption. And I believe, as this opening slide was, the name of this talk is, your fast follower strategy is riskier than you think. Because your strategy works until it doesn't, right? This guy's strategy was working for him as far as he knew in 2010, until it didn't. Now, this is kind of old trope. Everyone talks about Blockbuster as a poster child for disruption, and I know that financial services is different, but I think there are a number of things that make this a fairly apt comparison, certainly thinking about branches and real estate and location. You know, Brett King has a great saying that banking is no longer somewhere you go, it's something you do. And I think that's exactly the same thing that happened in the video space here. It used to be somewhere you go and you look through the shelves and you pick a movie and you know, they really never saw Netflix coming. Well, they did see Netflix coming. You can see some of their uh, quarterly updates, and they, they were not too concerned about mailing a CD or a DVD in and getting another one back. But they moved much more quickly to digital. And I don't think Blockbuster was a fast follower. And I, what I, people, particularly banks, when they tell me, well, we've got a fast follower strategy, I usually say you're half right. You're a follower, but there's nothing too fast about what you're doing. And that was certainly the case here. 2014, this, I could, I could probably go back, you know, probably about 100 years if we had an, enough data and show you that when we ask consumers what convenience means to them in banking, it looks something like this, with the number one thing being convenient branches near me. And as recently as two years ago, which this was, we were still building a lot of branches. We're finally starting to see last year for the first year that investment in branch banking starting to go down. But this lack of physical location, this investment in physical location, is still kind of a part of the old strategy because in one year, look how much it changed. In 2015, it was no longer first, not even second. 
That was now the third most important way to define convenience on the part of the customer. Number one now is a leading online mobile application. Second thing is no foreign ATM fees. Now I didn't do this survey and I don't know I know all the data so I'm probably jumping to conclusions here, which is my prerogative. And the conclusion I jump to here is what customers are telling us here is that's my money, that's not your profit center. So I expect to be able to use any ATM to get to my money. So we've really got to rethink the game here and not only the business that we're in, but the business model and how we're going about it. So this digital threat, we saw a big number from Goldman Sachs. If you want to look at it in terms of profit margin, McKinsey says it's a 35% risk. But the good news is there's upside that actually exceeds that. The ability to take a lot of cost out of the delivery side of the business to generate new products and new experiences and to deliver them not only in a better, more compelling way, but in a way that might actually even drive profits in the industry. So I think you've got to make a couple of decisions, particularly the bankers in the room, but I think all of us that play in this space. One, do you buy what I just said? Is there really a new landscape that's taking shape? Or does the old order prevail? And then are you going to do something about it or not? So that leaves you with a couple of choices. You can hope this is all a fad. You can double down on your existing strategies. You can hope this all goes away. You can give in to the fintech innovators. But I believe the path forward is really about embracing and engaging with fintechs. 1995, Tracy and Rearsma came out with a book called The Discipline of Market Leaders. And what they said was in any business, this wasn't just about financial services, there are really three domains, and you have to pay in all of them, but you're really probably only going to be dominant in one of the three. Is it customer intimacy, or is it product leadership, or is it operational excellence? Four years later, Hagel and Singer at Harvard came up with a very similar conclusion with slightly different titles. They called it instead customer relationship management, product innovation, and infrastructure management. I believe very, very few banks worldwide will truly be product innovators. I really think it's down to, are we going to manage the infrastructure, or are we going to manage the customer relationship? When I ask bankers to talk about this, I hear a lot of talk about the customer relationship management. And oh, by the way, that's my vote. I think that's really the way financial institutions are going to be able to carve a path forward. Because the one thing they still have is customers. They have lots of customers, and they have a lot of data on those customers. They know what they own. They know what they owe, what comes in, what goes out, when it goes, where it goes. And for all the fintech entrepreneurs, you have great technology, great customer experience, and it's darn hard to scale, isn't it? So I really think that the future is about getting customer intimate and using modern technology to build on those customer bases. And Jamie Dimon in last year's annual report for JP Morgan talked about this, about fintech startups are creating better experiences and moving things much faster than the industry typically does. And he said, we're completely comfortable in partnering where it makes sense. They're partnering with On Deck Capital and with uh, several other players. They're looking a lot in the robo-advisor space. The problem is that banks and fintechs are in completely different worlds. They speak different languages. I think they even have different fields of gravity. They're really very different. I'll let you decide which one is on Uranus. But I think it's going to take a little bit of work for these partnerships to actually come together and show some fruition. So this whole notion of innovation, and I believe innovation has to happen in banks. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Are you going to go it alone? Are you going to invest in it externally? I think in the partnership model, you've really got a chance for each side to play to their strengths. You can solve the right problems in the right way. Again, the bank has the customers. They have the data on that customer. The fintechs often have a much better approach, a much more efficient approach. But you also need to do it in a compliant way. One of the number one things that we see holding back fintech and bank partnerships is compliance. Most of the fintechs don't understand it well enough, and most of the banks are scared to death. They're going to do something that's non-compliant, 
And frankly, they just don't have that option. They can't be non-compliant. It has to be compliant. So they've got to find a way to work and test in a compliant sandbox. And I don't think that means just the regulators. We're seeing some very interesting things happen in the UK and in Singapore and in Australia, where the regulators are playing a much more prominent role. And I, the, I said in here in the, the panel from uh, SVP Payments, and he, he talked about the difference, be Eduardo, the difference between uh, US and UK, and, and we definitely take a little bit more of a passive approach from the regulators, but I, I think that's one of the critical things to make this work. So Jeffrey Moore, Silicon Valley icon, wrote a great book called Escape Velocity. And he really talks about this. And I think this is something that a lot of bankers need to pay closer attention to. Looking at really from a product portfolio perspective, most banks have a lot of stuff here. It's material to their financial statement, but it's not growing very fast. They probably have some things here too. It's not material, it's not growing fast, and they are want to kill them, and we, we, we need to get better at that. And these partnerships can really add the things here, these proof of concepts and pilots and these new ideas that are fast growing, even though they're not meaningful today, because ultimately we're trying to get here, right? This is where nobody's been better at this than Apple, right? Figuring out new source of growth, you know, first with digital music, then with smartphones, then with tablets, and this is the part banks haven't figured out. But banks are still, if you adjust for interest rate cycles and adjust for economic cycles, banks are really growing at low to mid single digits where the rest of the world, and certainly the tech world, is prone to the rise and fall of the S-curve, a period of steep growth and a period of decline afterwards. And the goal is to catch the next S-curve, jumping the S-curve as it was put in a 2011 book. And the way you get there, that stuff in the middle, is this I word called innovation. And it's a word bankers don't like very much because it sounds scary. It sounds like things the regulators really aren't going to like a lot. But it's really how we get there. And one of the things bankers struggle with is, is this the idea that changes everything? Or is this just a fad? And I like Bill Gates' quote here. Well, we tend to overestimate the change in the next two years, but underestimate what will happen in the next 10. So the key is to not let yourself get lulled into action. So again, this fast follower strategy, if you're really fast, it's one thing, but to be simply a follower, it's not such a good strategy. Gartner came up with the hype curve. I think it's a useful tool for us to think about how ideas come up to the peak of inflated expectations. We're certainly here with blockchain. We talked a lot about blockchain today and one more. There's some amazing opportunities with blockchain. It won't quite make you handsome and rich and make your kids smart and go to Harvard, like some of the people seem to be almost claiming. Uh, some of the ideas will drop down through the chasm and, and die off, but eventually these things catch traction and we catch the slope of enlightenment and ultimately, as Gartner calls it, the plateau of productivity. But I think it's interesting if you look at how do ideas actually take shape, it's because of human beings. Everett Rogers figured this out in 1957. It's just a bell curve out standard deviations. For whatever reason, he didn't carry it out to the second standard deviation on the right, but I assure you it exists. It's my mother-in-law. <laughs> you see me in the break, I'll tell you the story about her and the ATM. But Jeffrey Moore added something very useful to this too called the chasm. And the folks on the left of the chasm are fundamentally different than the folks on the right. And you see how the ideas play together here. And the problem for financial institutions is we tend to all live here. This is where phrases like nobody ever got fired for hiring IBM come from. We call them traditionalists and trailblazers. And trailblazers want to explore the unknown and discover best practices. And traditionalists want to master the known knowns and enforce best practices. There's nothing inherently right or wrong with either one of them but they're fundamentally different. And this is what makes the partnership so difficult. But those that figure it out are the most innovative companies and the most innovative financial institutions in the world. Because at worst, the traditionals become the business prevention department. Somebody came in here with an idea, but don't worry, I got rid of them. We won't hear from them again. <laughs> so ideas are a good thing. They might be a bad idea but we need to generate new ones and figure out which ones are really going to work for us. So I'm going to leave you with just a couple of 
thoughts here. One is the Kaizen model that Toyota is pretty famous for promulgating. And Toyota is a very interesting company because they're known not only for quality, but also for innovation. And those two things don't always go together. So it's maintaining the standards, very high production standards, but at the same time constantly improving. And some of that improvement is actually creating new things. And the way the Kaizen model looks at it and the way Toyota looks at it is as you move up the organization, your job becomes more and more about finding new ways of doing things, new sources of growth, and less and less about perfecting the things that we've already been doing for a long period of time. And I think this is a key for financial institutions to really embrace. So yes, we know we've got to live up to those standards. We know we've got to be compliant. But at the same time, we've got to put one eye looking forward. Because the risk of not taking risk, if you wait too long, and we're a slow follower like most of us are, is you miss all the growth opportunity. And all you're doing is playing catch up. I'm going to give you one quick example before I wrap up here. Here's a live example. US smartphone penetration now 76%. Anybody here not carry a smartphone? Anybody like my mother-in-law? Yeah, we're at 100% adoption here. So not surprisingly, the percentage of banking transactions on mobile now is exceeding what's happening in the branches. So this means last year, 1 in 10 US adults tried mobile banking for the first time, 25 million new mobile banking customers. And yet, according to the Fed survey, 16% said, we haven't quite gotten around to that yet. And another 6% said, yeah, you know, the thing's just a fad. We're, we're not going to do mobile. So I do think your fast follower strategy is riskier than you think. And I'll leave you with this closing thought. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. <laughs>